Welcome to Muscle Box Radio. I'm your host, Stephen Box, and my co host is Michael Harrison. This show is going to be all about nutrition, training, bodybuilding with loads of banter. We're going to be giving you the evidence, the science, and breaking that down with the help of some amazing guests and industry leaders to give you that application. So make sure you subscribe, and I hope you enjoy the show. How's it going? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. How are you? A lot better than yesterday. I was fucked yesterday. Yeah, I know. It's all right, mate. Don't worry. We'll just record this a day later. It's fine. Yeah. They won't know. No, they won't know. You've you've got to rush to get it out now, though. So, uh, yeah, good luck. Cheers. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, actually. Um, obviously, little uh, prep update from myself. Um, I'm now going to be keep competing in six weeks, not ten. All right, Lean Steve. Yeah, four weeks. Well, if I, if I can make it in time, I will do it, yeah. That's now the plan, is to do the um, fitness model competition in Scotland. Um, yeah, and then obviously get ready for the Men's Physique show with the rest of the Team Box guys. Nice, nice. Um, That's funny that you're, you're able to bring your um, competition forward, which is, which is a nice luxury to have. If anything, mine's going to be pushed back the other way. Uh, yeah, it was originally 10 weeks out. I'm now looking about 30 weeks out. So. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, I'm going to do the um, 10th of September, but 2018, I think I'll be ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. So I'll keep everyone posted about how this is going. Obviously, I'm going to have to step shit up a little bit, get a little bit more aggressive and a bit, a bit more assertive. And we're going to be interviewing my coach, Jeff, from 3D Muscle Journey at the weekend, aren't we? So um, that will go out next week, hopefully, um, as long as it all goes to plan. Um, we can sort out our time zones and everything. Um, but yeah, maybe we can ask him a little bit about how he feels when a when an athlete just throws that right in front of him and sets him off the rails, you know? Yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd be interesting. If anybody's un, unfamiliar with Jeff... Um, He's been a coach for like thirty years. Is he is he a pro natural bodybuilder or is he just? Yep. You know, yeah, he's a pro natural bodybuilder, um, and he's been a coach for literally thirty years. So he's got a decent amount of experience. Yeah, he's been competing for thirty years. You know, so um, he certainly knows his stuff. He's he's more than happy to admit that he was once a, a big bro. Mm-hmm. We now, all are. Now he's not so bro. He's still a little bit bro, but I, I think good. everyone's a little bit bro, aren't they? Gotta love the bro. Embrace the bro. You got it. That it's always a deep core. That little bit of bro. No matter how much you try and take it out, it's always gonna be there. Um, so, Mike, what are we gonna be talking about on today's episode? Which is episode five, I believe. I think we're gonna move slightly away from nutrition and focus a little bit more on um, my the favorite training side of things. Your m- mindset. No, no I said my favorite. Oh, your favorite. Um, training and. Nice. And the optimal, maybe, training split. Ooh, optimal. That's a dirty word, isn't it? Optimal. Well, we'll see. We'll find out, won't we? We will find out. Right. Um, And we're also still going to have our debate soon. Our low-carb versus uh, high-carb. And, obviously, high-fat versus low-fat diets. I think it's going to be me and Dan versus you and Chris, Mike. Is it really? I think that's what it's going to be, yeah. This is going to be hard for me because I hate high fat. (laughs) Mate, you were keto once. Uh, Yeah, for like three days. But I'm surprised how well I responded to it. (laughs) I responded really, really well. (laughs) I wanted to kill everyone. Yeah. (laughs) But I responded really well. Yeah. I, I could barely walk, but I'm pretty sure I'm suited to keto. <laughs> My training was dog shit, but um, I just think I was having a bad day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or it could be that you've got no carbohydrates. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, obviously, what I've actually got here for you guys looking on YouTube, um, not only is a new cool t-shirt, which says, ooh, because science... I think me and you have got very different um, definitions of cool. Yeah, well, we just got to look at your physical appearance compared to mine to um, go with yeah. that. Alice banded up. Yeah. Miguel. So, uh, yeah, obviously, you guys on YouTube, you'll see that behind me I have... Um, what? A bedroom. A bedroom. 
um, but with a whiteboard down on the floor. And on that whiteboard is a bit of a uh, mood board. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is essentially going to be training frequency. Um, we're going to be covering kind of, yeah, the body part splits versus other ways of splitting up your training programs. Um, when you might opt for one and not another, maybe we'd have a bit of a debate about which one's best. Um, and then we might even touch on a little bit of frequency of muscle groups, uh, which is related to that, obviously. Then we've got volume. We've also got uh, intensity and load. And then we've got progressive overload. And then we've also got exercise selection, rest, tempo, all that kind of jazz, which is sort of a little bit later on. So we'll kind of deconstruct how we maybe set up a training program for someone, shall we? Yeah, um, I just go straight to men's health um, <laughs> and get them on a Swiss ball as soon as possible. <laughs> You've got to. I was having this uh, conversation with a cl um, potential client yesterday, actually. And they, they did actually sign up, so yeah, a client. And um, they were talking about like how they used to play rugby and how they, they were interested in doing CrossFit. Because it was, there's like similarities between, you know, this functional kind of dynamic, uh, mixing it up training. And I was just like, no, it doesn't, it's not related in the slightest. No. Uh, on a rugby game, you don't start doing double unders. You don't start doing kipping chin ups. You don't start going, oh, well, hang on a minute. I'm just going to, uh, flip this tie before I get involved in the scrum guys. Jesus. What's going on, mate? Uh, that's my vicious dogs. Oh, I, hope, I hope nobody's here. Do we need to take a break? I don't know. Well, you let me know if we want to take a break. Uh, I'll let you know. It's just it's just the dogs being dogs. Yeah, it's pretty bad, mate. Yeah, I, I swear I'm going to strangle them one day. Right, we'll take a break and we'll be back once Mike sorted his dogs out. I'm going to kill them. Right, pause it. No animal cruelty. We let us not get this on video, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so we're back from the break. Uh, Mike, how's the dogs? Uh, I threw them over next door's hedge, so pretty good. We're right for at least 10 minutes, yeah? Yeah, until they fucking find a way back. <laughs> <laughs> like homing pigeons. <laughs> they are. You literally cannot drop them far away enough from the house. <laughs> Six, seven miles, they find their way back somehow. <laughs> anyway, so I was talking about how, um, you know, CrossFit's meant to be real good for rugby players, right? Sure. And I was thinking, well, for me, if I was a rugby player, I put it myself, I'm a, quite a small guy. But oh. I was like, well, I'd want to be big, so I'm going to need hypertrophy of yeah. everywhere. I'm going to be strong, so incorporating some power exercises, yeah. i.e. deadlift, bench press squat are going to be pretty useful and then maybe with some aerobic capacity right yeah that's more fit for purpose mm -hmm. than flipping a tire yeah. doing double unders fuck of course it is i love people when they say functional training functional for what when am i ever going to need to stand on a bosu ball and catch a fucking medicine ball or do a shoulder press Whilst I'm stood on a Bosu ball. What's, <laughs> what is functional about that? Like, the earth is not moving underneath me. Me and Dan were in the gym yesterday. This guy was just doing wrist curls. Nice. Because like, that's what you've got to focus on. You know, all the other body parts, you've got to get that, you've got to get so wrist curls done. Like, I literally have not trained my forearms ever. But yeah, I see people devoting half an hour to it. What yeah, mate, you, you do need to build up your left, though, because your right is dominating. <laughs> just a hell of a lot of fingering that's from <laughs> can we can i say that can i say that i think you just have mate i think you just gone there i just did i have ruined this podcast haven't i the dogs are now my language <laughs> fucking hell no never gonna no one's gonna listen to this i was like i'll go a little bit inappropriate but you've just gone fully in there no tact nothing like no barrier just well in. obviously if people don't like it then fuck off well yeah maybe can i say that 
Yeah, I you can't. I, think... I just did again. <laughs> I'm sure every. I'm sure all of our listeners are cool as so. Uh, they'll be. They'll be fine with a bit of expletive. <laughs> well, it was a good job. I just ticked the expletive box right from the start. Correct. There's no point even trying to vet it because it's just. Well, there's no point. Correct. So, um, oh, where do we get to? Wrist curls, right? So, yeah, this guy, like, I'm not being funny, but he could have done with spending his time elsewhere. If you're Mr. Olympia and they come back to you and say, oh, okay, you would have got a perfect score, but actually we feel like your forearms aren't quite in proportion to your biceps, then is there a point of doing wrist curls? Yeah, potentially. But if not, then no. No. Just no. Absolutely not. Like I like the, the the guys who are six stone overweight and doing crunches on a Swiss ball. What what are you doing? You could do literally a million crunches and you'll never see your abs. Stop doing it. Stop wasting your time. Well, that's what I had to say to you, mate, wasn't it? Well, that's it. I was rocking up and down like no like a monkey on a swing, wasn't I? <clears throat> on that Swiss ball, getting nowhere, hair flying around everywhere. It was just a mess. Yeah, well, anyway, we cleaned you up, so, um, yeah. I'm getting there. You're getting there, yeah. Ten weeks now, mate, anyway, isn't it? So you'll be all right. Uh, oh, I hope so. I hope so. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that confident response there. Yeah, I think you will, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I should hope so. You're my fucking coach. <laughs> I'm, not ta- I'm not taking any blame. <laughs> I don't make any guarantees. No refunds. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so training frequency. Well, I think we um, we've probably touched on this a little bit before. Uh, obviously, in a lot of conversations you and I have had, and um, I think the best way to look at this is always first of all from the point of what you can actually do. Right. So for me, when I'm looking at a client, it will be a case of okay. So are there any particular days that you definitely can always train on? Or any days you definitely cannot train on. So then I'm having a little look at someone's general week. And then from that point, I'll go, okay, well, what what can you actually fit in on a uh, you know weekly basis? Whether it's one session a week, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. And then I can kind of know their capacity. Yeah, sure. Uh, it, like uh, we said, optimal training, uh, training routine earlier. And it is optimal for... For the person, really, it's got to be the same as nutrition. It's got to be um, adherence always comes first. Yeah. And also, w- with that, you've got to bloody enjoy what you're doing. Um, and, and it does come back to that a little bit. Sometimes I need to have a little bit of give and take with my clients. And, um, you know, I might say to them, okay, I think this might be more beneficial. But if they don't want to actually do it, then, you know, you can take a horse to water, right? But can't always make it drink so yeah sure uh, and like you said if they don't enjoy doing it the chances are that whatever you've programmed in as being optimal if they do go and do it they're not going to be giving it 100 percent. so they might prefer to train a different way and, and although maybe studies might not show that it's the perfect way of, of, of developing muscle tissue it might actually be better for that individual because they enjoy it more they're going to train a little bit harder they're going to have more motivation and and get greater gains. Yeah, so I did a little bit of research yesterday, uh, read through one of the meta-analyses um, on training frequencies. Um, and the great thing about a meta-analysis um, is that they can pull a lot of data points together across a large array of um, studies. Because one of the things that we always find within the literature of um, you know, hypertrophy or strength training that it's actually really difficult to get enough participants to show an effect. Um, or significant difference Mm. so you know this was a great way of pooling lots of studies and I think they originally evaluated over 400 studies and whittled it down to about 10 within their inclusion criteria Mm -hmm. so yeah it was really good to read through that paper and then obviously now I can go back and read through each of the journals that they have referenced and took some time to look at yeah sure was that um Brad yeah 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 so Jeff. one day we might even be lucky enough to get him on the show. Yeah. That'd, yeah. Be, a, that'd be sweet, wouldn't it? It would be sweet. So, um, yeah, it's really good. Um, so for you guys who are maybe not familiar, or if you see now a meta-analysis who you know, might not have been familiar with that, you kind of get the general gist now. It's a case of looking over a large array of studies, 
looking at the data points across all of them and then seeing if there's any sort of significant difference between what you're actually trying to look for. And this one was comparing the difference between training once muscle group a week or multiple times. So whether that's two or three. Um, so yeah, I think the general conclusion of that paper was that training twice is probably more optimal than once. Um, whether three is more optimal than two, we don't know yet. And it's, just just to, just to make the point that it is volume equated as well. Yeah, some uh, most of the studies were volume equated. I think there was a couple that weren't. Um, there was a mix as well between untrained and trained subjects, which are always going to um, have a bit of a difference because obviously, as you know, when you start training, you get those newbie gains. So you could argue and say, well, anything you throw at a newbie, they're probably going to grow pretty well anyway for a while, providing that they're you know training with intent. But yeah, I think it was a nice little opener. And again, for more as more research comes out, we'll, we'll seem to get a little bit more of a stronger conclusion of how many times you should train a muscle group per um, per week, really. So let's go through. Well, I've got my little board here. Go on, Steve. All right, then. So can we see this, Mike? I don't know. Are you strong enough to lift it up to the camera? Yeah, just about, mate. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can, I can see that. So. This is unfortunate for people listening on iTunes, but. Yeah, but that's fine because they can always go on YouTube and have a look. Um, or what I'll do is I'll take a picture of this and then I'll put it on our Facebook page. Yeah. Uh, Team Box UK, isn't it? It is. It is. So yeah. they can go and check this picture out now of the board. But basically, the splits are. A body split so this is kind of like what we would joke around and call it the bro split where you might do chest on a monday yep back on a tuesday yep shoulders on a wednesday yeah legs on a thursday no skip that arms on a friday yeah because we're going out on the on the lash saturday abs yeah and forearms abs and forearms yeah yeah and traps and calves skip those skip those as well yeah so you're probably going to hit legs once a month. Uh, I think so. Yeah, uh, that was that used to be my method methodology back in the day. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah, it, it, I was very much of the uh, well, you can't see legs in a t-shirt, so um, what's the point? Yeah. And also, bigger legs makes your penis look smaller. So you need all the help you can get, mate. I need every inch. I, I need it. So <laughs> that, that's uh, that's my reasoning for having tiny stick legs. Yeah. Nice probably why you've opted for the men's physique class correct i don't think it was made for those types of guys but obviously you've adopted it you know and gone full yeah full blown no legs in all upper body yeah B believe me if there was a category where you could wear trousers I'd, um, <laughs> I'd, I'd do that and at the minute as well um if there was one incorporating like a girdle a onesie <laughs> yeah a onesie morph suit whatever so you got your body part split, quite traditional. That's what you kind of read in your Flex magazine traditionally. Um, what well, well, when when I was reading it back in the day, anyway. Um, and that can be pretty useful for some people. Um, in you know, it, you still can see good results from a body part split. Yep. But then we go to something like a push pull legs. So a push session would kind of involve your um, generally like chest exercises, shoulder exercises, tricep exercises. And then on a pull day, you would do kind of like back, lats, traps, um, biceps, biceps, uh, maybe a little bit of rear delt. That's a kind of a pulling exercise. You do like a high row or something. Um, and then on a leg day, um, right. you'd actually do some legs. Yeah. So you would do your glutes, your hamstrings, your quads, calves, and then maybe throw on abs whenever on any day you want, really. Um, and then with that one, obviously, you could do those sessions twice a week. So you could do push, pull, legs, rest, push, pull. So then you're getting in two sessions of push, two sessions of pull, once of legs. And then on the next week, you might end up doing two legs, two pushes, but only one pull, for example, if you were doing five days a week. Or if you're going six days, you could just go push, pull, legs, push, pull, legs, rest on a Sunday and then repeat. Um, so, yeah, that's quite a good split, I think, for a lot of people. A lot of people seem to enjoy that one, I find. Sure. And then we've got upper and lower. So this is, a, you know, this is actually the program that I'm on at the moment. My split goes upper, then lower, then upper, then lower, then upper. Nice. Yeah. 
just like that. Five days a week, three uppers, two lowers. Um, and on my upper days, it will be exactly how it sounds, basically. Back, chest, shoulders, arms. Yeah. Um, and then we've got a push-pull. So this is uh, something that I've never really done before. So this would be all pushing movements, including legs and chest and shoulders and triceps together. So that would be kind of like your, you know, your squat variations with your leg press, with your leg extensions, with your, um, you know, bench press, dumbbell re uh, press, etc. And then also on your pull day, you would do kind of more back, hamstrings, deadlifts, that kind of stuff. Have you ever done that sort of split before? No, no, I, I've, I've never done that. I, I'm, I'm familiar with it, though. You know, push is essentially the, the front of your body and pull yeah. is essentially the, 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 back. the back of your body, yeah. Yep. And then you finally you got full body. So that's just training every muscle group in one way or another. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put this down because it's a real annoying to hold. Yeah. Um, anyway. So that's kind of like what I thought would be a good synopsis of majority of the body parts split or different ways you could split up your week. So obviously some of those are multiples of, well, one, some are multiples of two, some are multiples of three. So you can then start to fit that in within a working week. Um, so for example, if I was training once a week, I would just go for a full body to make sure I'm covering my basis. If I was on twice a week, you know, maybe two full body sessions or maybe an upper lower split would be great or a push pull. Three times could be, uh, three upper bodies, uh, sorry, th oh, yeah. <laughs> three full bodies. It could be a, uh, upper lower upper or push pull legs, push pull legs. You kind of see where we're going with this. Um, and then obviously when you get the real specific routines might be when someone has a specific weak part where they really have to include some isolation work where like, for, like yourself, Mike, you're on a, um, double training days, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're in a lucky, or, or I'd say fortunate position to be able to do that. Obviously not everyone can, but some people can work it around it. I mean, you obviously set up your job, so you were able to kind of train and do the things that you love. So credit to you for doing that. Sure. So yeah, you know, there becomes a time when actually you might be able to split up the way you're training, sessions, putting in different isolation movements to bring up weak body parts. Sure. So, what do we think, Mike? What's optimal? So, <clears throat> obviously, the for, from what the study's saying, obviously the, the, the meta-analyses that you're talking about would be that when volume's equated, so what we mean by that is, is that let's say we do... Um, ten sets for a given body part, which is which has also been found to be the the sort of sweet spot, so to speak, um, in terms of um, <clears throat> dose response for volume. Um, let's say we're going to do that ten sets, but splitting that over two uh, days of five sets each is more optimal for hypertrophy than um, doing it all on one day. Uh, now that could be for a couple of reasons. One of those being that obviously, if you're doing them all on one day, the next, the 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 second the second half of the session, so the latter five, you're already going to be sort of fatigued from the first five. So potentially the load might go down in the second half of the session. You know the intensity is going to drop. You might not be able to get the full volume in. Um, so by splitting it up over the two sessions, you're then able to attack those five steps per session a little bit harder. And potentially you might be able to use a little bit more volume uh, and keep the load a little bit higher. And that also co uh, coincides with um, what we see in terms of muscle protein synthesis. So, so we know that when we resistance train, we, we have a spike in, um, which is localized to the area which we've trained um, in regards to muscle protein synthesis, um, which is the, uh, you know, the main driver of hypertrophy. Um, and, and that, that roughly lasts for, for something like 72 hours, I think, um, stimulation seen for. So Yeah, but what, even uh, less when with more experienced lifters, that time yeah. of 72 hours is going to decrease. So then it makes the case for them being able to stimulate that body part, um, uh, you know, again after that 72 hours. And like you say, for advanced trainers, maybe after 48 hours. Yeah. Um, so rather than leaving it a full week before you're stimulating that particular muscle again, maybe driving that um, that stimulation more frequently is going to lead to great hypertrophy, which has obviously been shown in the studies. So that, that that's what the studies say. Yeah, and for me, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, if I looked at this and gone, well, the biggest factor of probably, well, the biggest factor I would say of muscle hypertrophy is total volume load. And 
If we just looked at volume quickly, so when we talk about volume, we're talking reps times sets for, for one exercise. So if you're doing bench press, you were doing uh, 10 reps and you're doing three sets of, that would be 30 volume. So then obviously total volume load is when you bring load into the equation. So if I was doing 100 kilos for 10 reps, that's 1,000. Good, good math. maths, good maths. Times that by three, that's 3,000. Now that number doesn't necessarily mean much compared to other numbers in other exercises, but it's still a good number when you compare it against itself as an exercise. Hopefully that makes some sort of sense there. So I'm not gonna be like, oh, well, I'm just gonna do leg press, for example, because I can do the most load on there, because leg press is only relative to the training that you do on leg press, on that same machine at the same angle, and that kind of thing. So for me, if I'm doing this and I'm going, well, let's say I'm just gonna do three chest exercise, chest exercises in a week, I can do all three on one day. And like you said, by the time I'm getting to set number three, if I was doing bench press, my three sets of 10, um, at that 3,000, there's no way that I'd be able to probably maintain that three times in one session, but I could probably do that over three different days. So if I was to look at the amount of work that I'm doing on my chest is always going to be higher based on total volume load. Yeah? Yeah. I, I think that's a real easy way of kind of understanding how much work that you're doing in a given week. Yeah. So then obviously when we talk about volume equated, that's much more relating to the amount of exercises that is done, for example, or frequency um, on a muscle group in a week, and then also looking at the reps in the sets as well. Yeah. So that's kind of volume equated, uh, which, which really I think most studies should be volume equated if they can do so. Yeah. So on my little whiteboard here, I've just put it here. This is how you'd essentially split it up. You could either do bench flies then an incline press on one day or you know you might spread that across monday wednesday friday doing bench on a monday flies on a um wednesday incline press on a friday and that's your very basic version of how you may do it but obviously there's that also point of maybe like the metabolites that might get built up in that metabolic stress might not be as great when you're only doing one exercise so you need to make sure when you are doing that one exercise the dose response is enough for you to actually i suppose yeah kind of even get a pump right um yeah i mean yeah i i think yeah there is something in in, in sort of metabolic stress but i think that the main what, what's being seen is the main driver is mechanical tension yeah so i think i would always rather hedge my bets on the side of mechanical tension and being able to move that load you know, over the entire week, like you say, the volume load, yeah. rather than maybe just focusing on trying to get a pump as much. Yeah, yeah it feels great um, to, to get that pump and, and things like that, but I think in terms of hypertrophy, you, you might be better hedging your bets that one way, but again, it comes down to, to sort of maybe preference a little bit, I guess. Yeah, that, that's the biggest thing that I find, is that guys want to go to the gym and chase a pump. Well, of course they do. And you know, people it, it, look it, a little bit better, they look fuller, you know, and... and you get more motivated because you see yourself filling up a little bit with some blood and um, yep. you know, it's each to their own and some people probably couldn't just go in and do the three sets on their chest and wait until Wednesday for the next three sets yep. because they want to feel like they've got in and they've absolutely smashed the body part yep. and, and if you are that sort of person then then that's going to be beneficial for you really regardless of what the studies say. That's it, it you know in the research would still suggest you'd still still see results from training what okay. You know, it's, it, I must admit, if someone goes to me, Steve, we're going to go off piece, we're just going to go and train arms, I'm thinking, fuck yeah, let's go. Let's get, yeah. let's, let's get a pump on. Well, so, that's, it. that's it. And people have been doing it for years, right? And you've got to take something from the bros. Like, yeah. you know, they're, some of them are big guys. So yeah. it's not to say, when we, when we make suggestions, it's not to say that one thing just doesn't work. You yeah. know, like... Of course it works, you know, but it doesn't not stimulate, you know, um, hypertrophy. It just might be the fact that maybe there might be a little bit better ways of doing things, you know, if you're suited to that sort of style of training. Yeah, and this comes, I think, quite nicely into a couple of things. Is One, when you focus on mechanical tension, you start to choose exercises that are probably going to create more mechanical tension than others. So I get this a lot of 
uh, from actually my, I'm going to pick on them, but my female clients. Um, very much kind of like they want to train high reps. They want to do lots of giant sets, supersets, drop sets on their glutes, for example, with like cable kickbacks. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, let's get you squatting, deadla- uh, deadlifting, what's deadla- uh, stiff leg deadlifting, deadlifting, glute bridge, glute ham raise. Let's get you doing it frequently across the week using a good amount of load, but training with intent. So rather than, you know, them sort of doing 35 kickbacks with five kilos, I'd rather them do three sets of eight on back squats, but making sure that they're maintaining tension in their glutes while they're training. I think as well, what, what, what's being shown is that you need to put a lot more volume through when you're using loads of, uh, yeah, which don't, which allow sort of greater than 30, 30 reps, I think it was, um, that you actually have to perform more volume. So obviously that's going to just, that's going to end up taking a ridiculous amount of time yeah. um, to get the same response as you would a, a, a sort of a heavier load for, um, for, for less reps. Yeah, that's it. And essentially, it does come down to a little bit. We judge our uh, training plans by how far out someone is from failure and, and judging that as a point of intensity for choosing a load. So if someone was to say to me, OK, Steve, you're going to do 30 reps on a cable kickback. I'm going to get to 30 and they're going to go, how many reps could you have done left? And I could have been like, well, four and I could do do those four and someone could go how many more can you do well yeah another four so where do you really gauge yeah you never take glute kickbacks to one rep out from failure or to failure so it's really hard to judge that level of intensity yeah yes there's nothing wrong with um, if someone likes to do those exercises I was always say put them in your warm-up do them as like an activation drill Um, but I wouldn't really necessarily put it in as a uh, like you said about getting that dose for mechanical tension. Um, yeah. And obviously if there's points in your program or you're a little bit, you know, close to prep and you just think, Oh, I might just throw them in as a little bit of a superset to add on to what I'm doing. Then fine. As long as it's not negatively impacting your actual work that you're meant to be doing on the program. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, I get a lot of guys say to me, Oh, well, you know, now I'm in prep. Does this mean that I need to do a lot more volume or do supersets or drop sets? And I'm like, well, no, not necessarily, because I would rather you do your three sets of 10 on 100 kilos on bench press than do 60 or 70 because you're supersetting that with a 20 kilo dumbbell fly for 20 reps. Yeah. Um, And you're only giving yourself 30 seconds rest. Actually, I'd rather keep the volume high, uh, the total volume load high, um, because ultimately that's what's giving the stimulus of muscle protein synthesis, what's creating the adaptation for new muscle, and also what's utilizing calories the most. Sure. Um, and I think the research would also coincide with that after going to that PCT, that's uh, what James Krieger said, right? That uh, necessarily not yeah, resting for short periods actually helps you at all in your training programs. Yeah, so um, because I, I think I think that that was more related to hypertrophy. That it was seen that um, three three minutes was greater than um, the one minutes in terms of hypertrophy. Uh, but obviously, if you're using a, um, a a shorter rest time, your load is going to be um, sacrificed for that. Yeah. Um, so, it, and in terms of when volumes equated over the session, then it it really would make sense to keep that volume load higher um, in terms of in terms of uh, burning through calories um, because it uses more calories to lift a heavy load but I think when he said something about um, when that might come in handy to maybe drop the load would only be uh, in the expense of when greater volume is um, achieved. is going to be achieved yeah so then utilizing those sh- maybe shorter rests we're actually putting more volume through in total. Yeah. Um, but that's always going to be hard, right? If you're going to be using such short rest and potentially at that point in, in a prep, you're going to be, you know, very, very tired anyway. Uh, you, you're going to want to recover as much as you can really between, you know, between sets. But yeah, I mean, essentially, I think I think you've pretty much covered all, covered everything there, right? Yeah, I think this is kind of why I've chosen for a upper lower split. Because on my upper day, I will do essentially a push movement and then I'll do a pull movement. Yeah. 
So I'm giving myself a little bit of time to recover before my next push movement. So if I needed to, I could do a superset of bench press and chin ups. And I think for a long period of time, I could probably maintain a good amount of that total volume load. If I was then able to add in an additional pairing of supersets, i.e. maybe some dumbbell pressing with some dumbbell rowing, for example, if yeah. I can add that in, because obviously I've only got so much time I can actually train for, whether it's an hour and a half, an hour, um, I'm putting in more total volume load. Yes, I might be sacrificing some of those top markers, but yeah, more total volume load's going to be you know creeping in. But I also think there's that element of you need to keep some exercises which are lower in rep range so that you can maintain load cns and strength is you know performance as high as possible because then that's going to have a correlation onto your other lifts isn't it of how much load you can utilize oh definitely definitely i mean if you're fucking supersetting everything and you i mean you're going straight in and let's say you go right i'm going to jump on the bench press and superset with um with incline flies let's say for my chest and go straight to failure Chances are that sets two, three, four, five are going to be absolutely dog shit. Yeah. Um, so you, you would have been better just allowing yourself that little bit of rest. You know, like you say, gathering yourself, getting ready for the next set, able to use a greater load, you know, for, for the volume required rather than, you know, perhaps going ball out, balls out to failure and then having to drop the load late, later on in the latter sets or going, you know, instead of the 10, 10 reps you were going to get, you know, the next set you might get eight. The yeah. next set you might get seven, then you might get five, and then obviously then the volume's gone down, and then you're not um, you're not then creating progressive overload, um, and also if the volume's gone down, your um, your calorie expenditure's gone down. Yeah, and I think this is where that uh, training program DC came quite popular. That guys would go into the gym one maybe two sets, take it to failure, move on, um, but then obviously they were hitting those muscle groups more frequently. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think to just to sort of summarize, it's a case of making sure you're applying a plan that suits your preference in both what you enjoy and also what works within your week. Understand what the kind of literature says, what might be more beneficial if you are really looking to optimize your gains um, and then see where you can maybe make some, um, you know, a little bit of give and take maybe. Okay, you might want to sacrifice a little bit of enjoyment so you can put a little bit of this in. But then there might be cases where you need to also look at the periodization over your year to go, well, now I'm going to be in a calorie surplus. I want to focus on, for example, maybe my strength when I'm going to be using the most load. My CNS um, will probably get a greater stimulus on that. So actually my recovery is going to be faster because I'm in a calorie surplus. So it makes sense to do it then rather than when you're in a really severe calorie deficit, when obviously you've got a lot less load, there might be, um, you know, the inflammation that might get built up from using those heavier loads may lead to injury, for example, because obviously there's less nourishment. Um, and also because there's a lot less calories, you might sacrifice form a little bit because as we know, you get fatigued a lot faster. Um, so yeah, it's a case of being smart with your choices, but not going one extreme to the other, having maybe a blend of the two, mixing up rep ranges, and um, yeah, just there's no reason why you can't do a full body split, um, and then maybe on your next block of 12 or 16 weeks, you might swap that over for a full body, right, to do higher frequency. Yeah, yeah, it, um, I mean, it, it keep, keeps it exciting as well, like it keeps it fresh, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that, definitely. And I think one of the other things that we got to, and maybe we get Brad, uh, if we can get him on to talk about this, is maybe the limitations of what the research says with you know higher frequency training. Because if I think in the um, they did kind of like an analysis of what bodybuilders currently do, um, and I think sixty percent or sixty three percent, it was around that number, um, right. were doing a body part split. Yeah. So then obviously if they start to do something completely different, they're changing the variables of what they're currently used to. So there might just be that new... It's the novelty response, right? Exactly, or the placebo response. Mm -hmm. So if you had guys maybe who were already doing a full body, um, a, let's say a high frequency, um, you know, two or three times a week on a, mo on a body part, and then you put them on a bro split, would they see the same results? You know what obviously what we've seen in the research yeah sure so it's interesting um to know and this is where it's about being critical skeptical of the research and thinking about well what if they did it this way would the results still show the same effect 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I think we'll have a break and then maybe we'll, we'll get back and have a listener question. Yeah. All right, great. We'll take a break and we'll be back with you shortly. <laughs> So we're back from the break and obviously a quick opportunity to say thank you very much to our sponsors, Muscle Food. Um, yeah, well, obviously they were the ones who supplied our competition for everyone who subscribed, left a rating and a review. The, the winner was announced on the Facebook page of Team Box UK. They didn't actually come forward, Mike. So I'm going to have to redo it. I said I'll do it within 72 hours, so... Yeah, I'll have to do it again and announce it uh, when this podcast comes out on Friday. Mm. Well, this yeah. podcast might be out tonight, Thursday night, but um, yeah. Yeah, so if you're listening to this and you entered, get over to the Facebook page and you might have got a nice little surprise. Yeah, so make sure you like the Team Box Facebook page and then get notifications so then you get it, the notification, if you've won. Nice. Yeah, nice. So yeah, huge thanks to you for Muscle Food. That's a £75 voucher that they've put forward. Um, yeah, I think I'll be putting in, or, in an order next week anyway. So, we had a listener question, and we try to keep our listener questions kind of in keeping with what we've been talking about. So, if you do submit a question to info at teambox.co.uk, um, then obviously it might be a while until we get round to it because we're going to try and tie it in with what our themes are. Or if there's a guest we would like to answer the question, we'll put, put it forward to them. So this question is by Jacob. He's put, absolutely loving the emails and the podcast. Please don't stop. I've been learning so much and seeing big changes. Well done. It's great. Really good. So he's, he says, my question though, what's the best way to deal with inconsistencies in muscle bass? I.e. one pectoral muscle seems to have grown more than the other. Thanks, Jake from Bristol. Good question. So we yes. So how do we essentially bring up a body part that isn't quite as big or in balance or not as great symmetry as other muscles, Mike? Yeah, so... Um, genetics aside, obviously. Yeah, well, obviously, genetics um, and then also mobility can come into things like that. So if you particularly... I know he, he says his, his chest, his pectorals are... Um, not balanced, maybe he's got some mobility issues in his shoulder, you know, one side might be a little bit tighter than the other, so his range of motion's uh, not going to be as great. And I know I've suffered from exactly the same thing, so my um, my left pec is bigger than my right pec, and I've definitely got a, a smaller range of motion in, in my right shoulder, so that's something I'm still trying to work on, uh, and hopefully that's going to come in time. But in terms of what we've already spoke about, um, uh, if we know that greater frequency and maybe greater volume um, is a driver for more hypertrophy, then perhaps prioritizing that on those weaker areas. So maybe hitting your chest two, even three times a week um, over you know the other areas that might be a little bit stronger. So like for myself, I know that my back is my strongest area, so I only train it once a week. Whereas I train my chest twice, maybe three times. So you're doing more volume. So I'm putting more volume through that area in in order to bring it up. And if you think about it in a way that, let's say you train for 50 weeks out of the year, and you and you only train it once, then you've, you've you've hit that 50 times. Now if you if you train it twice a week, then you've hit that now 100 times. So so for me, that's going to have a greater effect in bringing up bringing up that area. Um, and then also you've got the volume that you actually utilize with exercise selection so you know if you were doing let's say f five to six exercises in a session then you might just put a higher proportion of those on chest so it could be if you, on my day for example when i train my, my back's actually my weak point and my chest is a real strong point for me so on an upper day that you'll see more back exercises in that day than you you'll see chest or shoulders because for me at the moment that's really what i want to bring up yeah sure so it's not just volume across the week is it it's volume even within a session in the session yeah and that that's how i structure my training so uh, you talked about me doing double days earlier and obviously not everybody's got that luxury but my double days i've actually split up my push sessions um, and that's what constitutes my double day. So in the morning, I, I'm able to have a, f a session fully on my chest, and then in the evening, I then go and do my shoulders and my triceps. 
So essentially, I, in, I'm putting more volume through it per session and also per week because I do that twice a week. But so then also as well, what you're doing is you're going into that training session or training belt and you're training your weaker body parts first, mm -hmm. not the body. What most people do, I think, is they go in and they train their best body part or their favorite body part or whatever they're strongest on first, which is only going to make your strongest, biggest body parts bigger because they're going to be less fatigued. So, Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, there, there comes a point where you, you've got to suck it up and man up, really, and, and, and train your weaker areas. Nobody likes doing it. It's, it's not no fun to train the areas that are looking that are looking small and flat when you're training it, you know, that you perhaps don't get as good a pump in, you know, it's no fun. Yeah, People yeah. want to train, you know, the, their weaker areas to show off, you know, because they think it impresses somebody. But yeah, another, another, another method I use is, is that obviously I, I hit my chest um, both times after a rest day. So I hit my chest on a Monday after I've rested Sunday and I hit it again on a Friday after my rest on a Thursday. So being able to prioritize that weaker area after a day where you've perhaps rested and you're a little bit, um, you know, more recovered rather than maybe say, let's say you're wanting to develop your chest and you're doing a pull, a pull session on a, on a Monday, a leg session on a Tuesday, then by the time you get round to that chest or on your push session, you've already done two other sessions that week before, yeah. you might be a little bit drained. Um, so I would bring, I would shuffle it around the 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 order in which you're going to do it, and put the um, the weakest area next to the rest day. Yeah, so exactly. So I think we've got probably three easy tips there: is to increase the amount of times you're hitting that across the week by doing more exercises and more volume. Essentially, you've then got by prioritizing that muscle group or exercise first within your workouts, and then also prioritizing that session first when you are most recovered so yeah. three easy things there that you can start to do what you mentioned earlier about ranges this is something that i'm a real kind of like stickler on um is actually what is full range of motion a lot of people will think full range of motion is going from the bottom to the top um on a bench press for example if we keep with the chest so or let's take a dumbbell press for example this is a real bugbear of mine so a lot of people think when they think, okay, I'm going to do my chest, I'm going to do dumbbell press, I'm going to do full range of motion, I'm going to go from the bottom and I need to touch them in the middle at the top. That's full range of motion. Now, that what the exercise might look like, but if you're not getting tension at any point within that movement, full range of motion, for me anyway, stops. So if you're at the bottom and there's no tension in your pec and it's all in your anterior delt, maybe even in your lap, then there's no tension in your chest. So actually you've maybe gone down too far because you, you don't have the mobility to maintain tension through your chest. So essentially what's going to happen here is that your muscle groups that are your strongest, i.e. in this position your anterior delt, is going to be doing most of the work. So actually your pec doesn't need to do anything because it knows your delt is going to compensate your body is much smarter than you are, so it's always going to try and dissipate force or energy um, or load where it possibly can for the easiest possible time. It's you as an individual who has to kind of like get that mind muscle connection and train with intent so you can constantly keep tension on the muscle group that you're trying to bring up. So when you're bringing those weights down in that eccentric portion of the lift, as soon as you start to feel tension coming off your pec, that's enough. You stop there and you start to go back on the concentric over time is obviously you become more mobile you that range of motion may increase so you might get a fuller stretch on the pec but i think for me i always try and say try and get your pe your uh, pecs as tight as you possibly can at the top range and then as you lower them down you're trying to maintain that tension within the pec when you get to the bottom you maybe start to get to that point where you feel it coming off you press back through as hard as you possibly can now when you get to the top part of the movement, you've now got to start thinking about the actual exercise that you're using and the, the kind of tool that you're using. So with a dumbbell, it only works against gravity. So the dumbbell works and the load goes vertically down. So if your arms come straight in front of your shoulders and you lock your arms out, the load is suspended by your skeletal system. Now, I bet most people could probably put 50 kilos in their arms, straighten their arms out and hold it there for, you know, a good few minutes, right? Mm -hmm. 
But if what they were actually doing was stopping themselves outside of their shoulders, so um, it's really easy for me to demonstrate on the video here, but maybe I'll put up a video at some point on the Facebook page so people can see this. But I don't bring them in together, I keep them outside of my shoulder alignment because then my pecs are constantly engaged. By that way, if I was to just say try to hold those 50s, I wouldn't be able to do it for very, very long compared to if I fully locked out. So if my goal is to target my chest, then great, that's exactly what I want to be doing. I want to be keeping the tension outside of my shoulders, uh, making sure that there's constant tension throughout the entire range of mo motion. And for me, that's full range. If I wanted to activate my triceps, different story. I may want to go to where my triceps actually lock out. But then that's probably not the best exercise to hit my triceps in there long and short range anyway. So I think exercise selection become, become really important. Understanding what is full range and maintaining tension the entire time. But also keeping that mind muscle connection, activating your pecs, pushing through them the whole time. And that should hopefully help. It goes the same for calves, glutes. Whatever your weak part is, um, it's about understanding that. And I think that's the only reason why my back's come on this year is because I've actually learned how to train it. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> like we spoke earlier about, um, you know, keeping the load the, the load high, but th th that's only to the point of which you can maintain the tension throughout. Yeah. I mean, we, we, you see so many people throwing dumbbells around when they're bicep curling or, you know, bouncing a bar off their chest and locking out at the top and on a bench press. And yes, you might be able to move that weight from A to B, but that's not what we're saying, you know, in terms of load. It should be the most load you can you can lift while still keeping tension throughout Throughout the whole range of your working sort of um, sort sort of sort of range, and like 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 Steve said before, I've got the problem where because I, as I spoke about, my shoulder mobility is not great in my right hand side. That when I come down um, in the eccentric, that the tension actually does come off my chest and moves onto my interior delt, like like chest, uh, like Steve was saying. So I've got to make that conscious effort until I get that range of mobility yes. to to stop that little bit shorter than perhaps I should do. And it might look to other people, I might be doing half reps. But for me, you know, that's maintaining that tension and that's what, that's always going to develop my chest to a greater amount than if I'm each rep taking the tension off, giving it a little break, um, putting putting some force through my shoulders, you know, and then potentially the movement's going to break down um, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not going to see the progress I'm wanting. That's it. And, you know, just spending some time working on that, you're going to get better activation. So then once you've got that and you start to go, let's say, a fuller range of motion with a barbell again, and you'll probably, you'll start to be able to get that recruitment that you want. So then it will start to continue to grow along with your anterior delt, along with your triceps. So yeah, again, having a periodized plan where you focus on different areas, um, and if it is a weak part, make sure you are tackling your form, because I can imagine, even if you tackled form first before worrying about maybe even frequency, it's probably better, actually, I would say, because if you're, it, you could train your, you know, for example, upper pec every single time, I once had a guy come up to me and he said, Steve, I'm re um, where should I bring the bar down on the incline press? And I said, well, hang on a minute. What muscle group are you trying to train? To us, that's quite a, you know, maybe a silly question. But I'm so glad I answered, asked that question because he said, I really want to improve the bottom part of my pec. And I was like, well, you, for a start, we're doing the wrong exercise. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure we're doing the right exercise selection for the portion of the lift then we can start worrying about where the bar needs to come down so again it's you know you can do all the frequency you want but actually if you're doing the wrong exercise with no form or without the right range of motion without tension that frequency is kind of pointless yeah cause, i mean mate, you're being attacked by flies <laughs> it's because i fucking stink mate um yeah yeah i mean essentially it, it, when you look at um, a weak body part you might just look at it and say, well, why is that area weak? Maybe maybe it's not just genetics. Maybe it's the fact that I may not have been performing that movement correctly through you know, your one or two years worth of training, whereas you might be able to activate your chest a little bit more or something like that. You know, you're know, you going to be um, getting great progress within that chest. And then, it, like, like yourself, you, you might not be able to train your back because you can't see that muscle working. When you're working it, you might not be able to contract it as well, so your form might not be quite there. And that might be a reason rather than genetics that, that you're not developing in those areas. So definitely paying some some attention to making sure that that form is correct is gonna be, you know, um, gonna be massive. Yeah, nice. So we'll have a quick roundup then of training. 
So, so let's summarize how you create a training plan. First of all, Mike, tip number adherence. one. Adherence and uh, time that they can train per week. Nice. Number two. Enjoyability. Nice. Number three. Probably weak points. Ooh. Okay, nice. Number four. Um, obviously with the weak points and that would be that would dictate the frequency. So that would dictate probably the split that I'm gonna use. Nice. So let's say they wanted to work on their chest like I do, then the frequency I might use on their chest might be twice a week. So then that would eliminate and the, the body split, so to speak, potentially. So I, I might look at more like a, uh, a push, pull, legs, push, pull, or something like that. Yeah, nice. And then we can start to break things down into volume, can't we? Um, and start to utilize when we want to go a little bit heavier, when do we want to do maybe more repetitions. And perhaps yep. on another podcast, we can talk a little bit more about volume sets and reps. Um, yes. You know, there's going to be loads of debates out there. Should you do 10 sets of 10? Should you do three sets of 10? Or, you know people asked me the other day yeah but do you only do any high volume stuff like 100 rep sets and i'm like no no, no. Like, so, i'm gonna hate that yeah but on the off chance i might do a disgusting drop set like i did the other day on the hack squat and i must have been my legs are in bits but i immediately regretted that decision <laughs> 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 so um yeah once you've kind of decided roughly what rep ranges you want to work in you can then start to choose exercise selection taken into consideration obviously weak areas any muscle groups that you want to particularly bring up um and then we can start to worry about tempo ranges and all that kind of stuff later on yeah nice yeah, definitely the, the less important stuff yeah nice mike well we'll leave it there buddy and i will speak to you on saturday anyway because obviously we're going to be interviewing jeff big jeff big jeff and um, he can drop some wisdom from his experience. You nearly said bombs then. He's not going to be dropping bombs, mate. That's pathetic, isn't it? We're not in World War Two now. Dropping bombs. Dropping knowledge bombs. What does that mean? I, I don't know. You've answered a question. What? <laughs> Probably incorrectly, anyway. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, anyone dropping knowledge, knowledge bombs are probably dropping them incorrectly. Yeah. Anyway, but um, right, guys, we'll leave it there. And thank you so much for subscribing, listening, leaving a rev a rev a rev whatever. But um, if you can continue to share our shit, that'd be great. We'll get more subscribers, more listeners. We can get more guests on. Um, you know, we've had great feedback so far and I'm so excited. I know me and Mike have been so motivated now to continue to do podcasting and yeah, help as many people as we possibly can. And if you do want help with coaching, you know where we are, you know how to find us. We can just get book in for a call and we can hopefully help you out a little bit. Um, yeah, we're pretty friendly service, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we, um, we're all decent, you know, I can be a twat sometimes, but um, I'm pretty sure everybody's gathered that from from this, but yeah. If, uh, yeah well, if, after fingering, if, yeah, after fingering ruined it, uh, as it always does. Um, but yeah, if if you want our emails, then obviously you can sign up to our to our daily emails, and you'll get these show notes, and that's over at our website www.team-box.co.uk. Nice, mate. Right, we'll leave it there, Mike. Catch you Bye. later, buddy. Ciao.